بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدًا عبده ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وخليله بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الله به الغمة وجاهد في سبيل ربه حتى أتاه اليقين اللهم ارزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وتوفنا على ملته وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا ثم أما بعد My dear respected brothers and sisters Inshallah uh, very soon within 10 days the month of the Hijjah will start and this is the time when uh, many Muslim brothers and sisters, inshallah, um, are uh, planning to go for Hajj this year. So, inshallah, uh, the main goal of this uh, khutbah is to remind my brothers and sisters who did not perform Hajj yet, um, to remind them about the excellence of Al-Hajj and how great um, uh, it is uh, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all know that Hajj is one of the five pillars uh, of Islam. And this in of itself raises an important question. Why is that? Why that Hajj is one of the five pillars of Islam? For those who are able to financially and physically perform Hajj, they must do so once in their lifetime. Um, and before we go further, <clears throat> this in <clears throat> indicates that so many benefits very high objectives that we Muslims can and should achieve when we perform Hajj. So the fact that it is one of the five pillars of Islam indicates how important it is for us, how important how the great benefits of Hajj spiritually, intellectually, and socially. When we go for Hajj and Umrah, we are called the guests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi Wasallam said the Hujjaj and Umar are the guests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he said their supplication for forgiveness are granted and their prayers are answered. When you go and visit someone you should expect some sort of generosity. Depends on how much he has, can offer and how generous he is. You may visit someone who is very wealthy but it's not very generous so you'll get a little bit or someone who is not wealthy but very generous, um, you, he will also give you uh, what he can. But when you visit someone who is extremely wealthy and extremely generous, then you should expect so much. So when we go to Allah's house, subhanahu wa ta'ala, answer his call, we should expect so much. Because he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the most generous, and everything belongs to him. And he asks us to ask him. He wants us to ask him. It's a form of ibadah to ask him. So when we go there, we should keep in mind that we are the guests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is the right of the guest upon the host right, to receive something, to get something. So the Prophet sallallahu when asked about the best <coughs> deeds, the Sahaba usually used to ask about the best deeds, not ask about just silly questions. They ask about the most important deeds. And Rasulullah sallallahu said, in uh, to answer this question, to have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger, to believe in Allah and His Messenger. <clears throat> then he was asked, What's next? And he said, Al jihadu fi sabilillah, to strive in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he was asked, What's, what's next? He replied, Hajjum mabrur. Iman, jihad, and Hajj mabrur. And the Hajj mabrur is the, the definition of the mabrur Hajj uh, is the faultless Hajj. There is no sin or no um, uh, uh, you know, other intention but to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, and that is graced with the divine acceptance and Allah's pleasure. So Hajj al is the pure Hajj, when the intention is pure and the Hajj uh, uh, avoids all uh, faults or vain talks or harming anybody or committing any sins. This is Hajj al this is one of the best deeds in Islam. And Rasulullah sallallahu again to make the, had, the, the connection between Hajj and Jihad in this particular hadith, he said Iman, Jihad and Hajj. And he sallallahu in other hadith in Bukhari and Muslim um, uh, affirmed the fact that Jihad is a form, uh, sorry, Hajj is a form of Jihad. 
The person came to him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I am weak and I am coward. What should I do? And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you may go for a jihad or striving for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That involves no fighting. That is Hajj. And Aisha radiallahu anha asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, should we not, women, uh, strive and actively participate in jihad with you? Why only men participate in jihad fi sabillah and we don't? Should we? He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the best and the most beautiful striving for you in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is hajj mabrur. Women also were very eager to um, compete with men in gaining the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu told them the most beautiful jihad for you is Hajjun Mabrur, Hadith in Bukhari and Muslim and Aisha commented she said after hearing this from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi I shall never cease performing Hajj Rasulullah sallallahu also told us that when we perform Hajj we come back from this journey um, sinless purified it's one of the mechanisms of purification in Islam. So he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that those who perform Hajj fi sabilillah and avoid all um, sins will return after Hajj from, uh, from all sins as, uh, uh, free from all sins as he was the day his mother gave him birth. And the ulama talked about this and they said, what's mentioned here is the Sagha'ir uh, al but the kaba'ir of the noob, the major sense, it requires a specific and sincere tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amr ibn al-As, radiallahu anhu, one of the sahaba, he became Muslim um, relatively late, um, the, around the time of Fath Makkah. And when he came to, he fought against the Prophet and he killed some Muslims. But when he came to give the pledge of allegiance to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he extended his hand and Rasulullah sallallahu extended his hand to shake his hand and then um, Amr withdrew his hand and Rasulullah asked what's going on, what's the matter? He said, Dear Rasulullah, I have a question before I fully um, give you bay'ah, uh, bay'at al-Islam. He said, what is this? He said, oh, how about all evil things that I've done before Islam? And Rasulullah um, told him that don't you know Islam wipes off all past sins and hijrah from Mecca to Medina also wipes off all previous sins and Hajj similarly wipes off all past sins. So um, this is one of the great um, uh, virtues of performing Hajj fi sabilillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, finally, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu said about this Hajj Mabrur, if we strive to perform Hajj Mabrur, that means that we gain our money from halal and every money we spend it's coming from halal source. And our intention is pure and clean. Only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not for the sake of people or to get the title hajj. Right? And to try to avoid harming anybody or committing any sins. This is hajj mabrur. According to Imam al-Hasan al-Basri, rahimahullah also, he said about al-hajj al-mabrur, one of the definitions of al-hajj al-mabrur, he, he said that this means that the person, after performing hajj, should desire and be inclined to the life of the hereafter rather than the material pleasures of this dunya. This is his definition of Hajj Mabrur that makes it a great change in our heart that we become al akhirah oriented, focusing more on um, uh, the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to be very busy with the pleasure of this dunya. This is the sign that that Hajj was Mabrur. This is one of the signs. And, and I, every time we go for Hajj, uh, brothers and sisters ask me, is there any sign that uh, our Hajj is accepted, our Hajj is Mabrur? How do we know? Right? And this is one of the signs that if Hajj changed your heart, changed your, your paradigm, changed your, your, your focus, that, that, that really went deep, the meanings of Hajj went deep into your heart and changed the way you look at the entire world. You become more concerned about your life after then being indulged uh, in the worldly uh, affairs. So he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, um, that all sins committed in between the performance of one Umrah and another, and one Hajj and another, are expiated and erased, and the reward of Hajj Mabrur is nothing save paradise. 
The reward of al-hajj and mabrur is nothing but paradise. So for those who are planning to go this year or next year, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we just need to prepare ourselves very well before we take this journey by purifying our intention and, and consider this to be um, the last trip we are doing before we make the, another trip to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can see the similarity between the two. Many of us go alone, they leave their family, their children, their wealth, their position, their properties, and they just go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They always take shower before the ihram and they wear these two white garments, right? And they go physically and spiritually to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this reminds us of another journey that every one of us will take. Usually we'll leave everything, or every one of us will leave everything behind. We wear this white garment that we call kafan, right? And we go alone to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we can see the similarity between the two. If you want that second journey to be peaceful and enjoyable, then let's try to make our hajj also peaceful and enjoyable. And we make sure that it is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the ulama talked about um, whether we should perform hajj immediately once we are able to afford the journey or we can delay it to opinions but the opinion that suggests that once you are able to make the journey you should not delay it because you never know what will happen in the future you never know what will happen in the future nothing is guaranteed today you are healthy you have enough money situation is, uh, is, is allowing you never know next year what will happen we always expect next year will be much easier than this year, but again, nothing is guaranteed. One of the pillars of Islam, it's not a small thing that you can delay. We should take it very seriously, and once we are able to do that, um, we should immediately um, uh, go and perform Hajj. One of the benefits of Hajj, in addition, of course, of the spiritual um, meanings, is to connect really ourselves with our Ummah, our community. And when I talk about our ummah, we're not only talking about the geographic ummah, we're also talking about the historic ummah. We, when we go, one of the great benefits of Hajj is that when we go there to this ancient house, the most ancient house, Bayt al Atiq, Awwal Bayt, the first house of worship has been established on earth for people. So this reminds us that we belong to this great community of believers. Start from Adam, alayhi salam. The house actually was, you know, Adam السلام, when he came on earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him about al-bayt al al-haram and he did perform hajj there. All or most of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala went to this place to um, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to submit to his will. So when we go there, we remember all these great prophets who went to al-masjid al-haram. We remember the struggle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to clean and purify this al-masjid al-haram that has been surrounded by 360 idols. Arabs used to come perform hajj there, carrying their gods with them. Every tribe bring its gods with them and they do sacrifice for the sake of these false gods. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the first 13 years of his uh, career as a prophet, he could not destroy these idols physically. But he started talking to the hearts and the minds of the people. Try to introduce the pure Islam, bring them back to the tradition of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And the presence is, of, of Ibrahim alayhi salam and his family is, is amazing. When we, everywhere we go, uh, in Hajj, whether in Mina, in Arafat, in Muzdalifa, Sa'i between Safa, we remember the family of Ibrahim alayhi salam. His sacrifice, his wife's sacrifice. His wife's jihad between Safa and Marwa. He's the one who rebuilt Al Masjid Al Haram. We connect ourselves with Bilal, alayhi alayhi, anhu ardah, the first Muslim ever to call Adhan in this place. It was Bilal. He chose Salah Salam Bilal to climb on the top of Al Kaaba and to call the Adhan. Just to send a very strong message that. No race, or ethnicity, or color has any privilege or supremacy over others. 
That was the beautiful adhan of Bilal radiallahu anhu. But we also remember that Al-Kaaba, Al-Masjid Al-Haram is what unites all Muslims around the world in our time. When we face this direction, we connect ourselves with all our brothers and sisters who are facing the same Qibla. It becomes a, a great symbol of unity and connection with people that we don't really know. There's nothing common between us and them except La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. We remember their pain, suffering, and their needs, their concerns. And Muslims ought to go together and meet each other and get to know about the concerns and um, hopes and worries that other Muslims are facing. This is how Hajj used to be in the old days. Muslims come from everywhere in the world, meet each other. They live with each other in Mina for four days. They meet each other in Arafat and they get to know about one another. Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, al-Faruq, he used to see his, his governors, mayors. He meets them there. This was like an annual conference when he meets people and he meets their, their governors. So he meets the people of Kufa or Basra or um, Damascus or Egypt and he asks them about the price of meat. This is for him, this is an indication of how prosperous the society is. What are kind of problems you go through? And then he brings the leader of this particular city. And he tells him that people are complaining that the price is so high. Why is that? People are complaining that there is a high rate of unemployment. Why is that? This is your responsibility. I appointed you to serve people. And sometimes he fires immediately. In the season of Hajj, you are out. And then he hires another one. So people and their leaders, they come to the big leader, that's Omar in Mina, and meet him there. And they directly have access to the highest leadership position in the Muslim Ummah, the successor of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they can directly talk to him and raise their complaint to Omar radiallahu anhu, and Omar makes the right decision. And when he finds out that what these complaints are, are real, then he does fire this because he, in the end of the day, he feels that I'm responsible eventually for all these things that happen even far away. So he created this mechanism of you know, allowing people to um, directly talk to him and have access to Amir Mu'mineen. And then he questioned these leaders why you are not taking care of your people. He is the one who made this very famous statement that if a donkey stumbled in Iraq, I'm afraid that I'll be asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why didn't you pave the road for this donkey? This is sense of, of responsibility, of everything happening in his ummah. He took this position and he understood that he is not only responsible for the well-being of humans, but even animals. He is also responsible for them. So now when we talk about our Muslim ummah, um, I'm sure you have follow the news and, and, and the most dramatic and tragic image or images of Syrian people are fleeing um, explosions and, and, and vicious war in their hometown and the pictures of young children and women drowned in the Mediterranean trying to escape this to go to Turkey and from Turkey they try to go somewhere else in Europe when they can't live. But subhanAllah, we have seen these images of young children, three and five years old. That the, wa the waves pushed them out and they reached to Europe but as dead bodies. And people who put their entire family in a uh, very weak boats try to make the trip and they've been rejected by Europe who always claim that they have the highest standard of human rights and democracy. It is Europe who is responsible for most of the troubles that's going on in the Muslim world. It is the Europe, it is Europe that's responsible for sponsoring and supporting the dictators who are responsible of these wars and now they are refusing to receive these vulnerable and weak families. The Prime Minister of Hungary just made a very um, disgusting 
statement when he said that receiving so much Muslim refugees would change the Christian nature of Europe. He just said it very clearly. He said, you stay in Turkey. Turkey is safer for you. Don't need to come here. And it's available online. Daily Mail News. They said these refugees are filthy and we don't need more filthy people to come to our, to our countries. And what's even worse is the silence of the Muslim Ummah. One of the um, representatives in one of the Gulf, very rich Gulf countries, he said, no, we cannot because we cannot receive these people because their nature is different, their culture is different, and everything is different, and this will change also the demography of our country, and we, we cannot receive these refugees. That's even worse than the position of Europe. With the exception of the position of Turkey, almost the entire world has turned a blind eye to these victims who are, have to choose between being burned or drowned in the sea. It's very bad. I've received some um, suggestions, actually some people suggested that for those who are going for Hajj for the second or third time, please don't go for Hajj this year and donate this money to these people. And some actually made another suggestion. I don't promote, but I'll just share it with you. They said that today, for Muslims who are going to stand in the mountain of Arafat, open up Arafat for these refugees. Let them come and stay in Arafat to find safe haven, safe place, where they just enjoy the basic human rights. So the season of Hajj comes this year when we see this pain and suffering and many of us try to do something and we should always try to find ways to help these people. This is our reality, this is our situation and we need to remember that we should always remember these brothers and sisters in our prayers and we should help them as much as we can. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق والمسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد brothers and sisters إن شاء الله tonight we will have a Hajj workshop after صلاة المغرب um, for those, inshallah, who are going for Hajj this year, we'll go and explain, inshallah, the steps of Hajj. And inshallah, if you have any questions, we'll be more than happy to answer it. اللهم إننا نسألك الهدى والتقى والعفاف والغنى اللهم إننا نسألك رزقا طيبا وعملا متقبلا اللهم أصلح لنا ديننا الذي هو عصمة أمرنا وأصلح لنا دنيانا التي فيها معاشنا وأصلح لنا آخرتنا التي إليها معادنا اللهم اجعل الحياة زيادة لنا في كل خير واجعل الموت راحة لنا من كل شر يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث فأصلح لنا شأننا كله اللهم لا تكلنا إلى أنفسنا طرفة عين ولا إلى أحد من الناس يا رب العالمين اللهم انصر الإسلام وعز المسلمين اللهم انصر إخواننا في سوريا اللهم احفظ دماءهم وأعراضهم يا رب العالمين اللهم احفظ إخواننا وأخواتنا وأبناءنا في سوريا يا رب العالمين اللهم احفظهم بحفظك واكلأهم بعنايتك ورعايتك اللهم كن لهم نعم المولى ونعم النصير اللهم آوهم وأطعمهم واسقهم واشفهم وعافهم يا رب العالمين اللهم استر عوراتهم وآمن روعاتهم اللهم استر عوراتهم وآمن روعاتهم اللهم استر عوراتهم وآمن روعاتهم كن مع إخواننا المسلمين المستضعفين في أرضك في كل مكان يا رب العالمين ويا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اشفنا واشف مرضانا مرضى المسلمين وارحم موتانا موت المسلمين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصلي اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم